two jets, same family, same cockpit, same era. But only one became the most successful regional jet in North America. Its bigger sibling, despite being larger, more comfortable and more capable, struggled to find a long-term place in major airline fleets. Today, we're exploring why the Embraer 175 became a regional aviation legend and why the E-190 never reached the same heights. By the end of this video, you'll understand exactly why one jet dominated the skies while the other fell behind. At the dawn of the 21st century, regional aviation was due for a transformation. The skies over North America were filled with smaller aging jets like the Bombardier CRJ-200 and CRJ-700, alongside the early generation of ERJ-145s. These aircraft were reliable, yes, but they weren't designed for passenger comfort, with the growing expectations of travelers who were used to more space and quieter cabins on mainline aircraft. Airlines faced a real challenge. How to provide more frequent, flexible service on thinner routes without driving operation costs through the roof. Embraer saw this opening and launched the E-Jet family, intending not just to create a series of aircraft, but to redefine what a regional jet could be. Their vision was ambitious, aircraft that were efficient, modern, and passenger friendly, capable of bridging the gap between traditional regional jets and smaller mainline jets. The family initially included the E-170 and E-175, smaller jets designed for feeder routes and short sectors, alongside the larger E-190 and E-195, intended to serve slightly longer or denser routes with more passengers. What made these aircraft stand out was their consistent design philosophy. All of them featured fly-by-wire controls, wide aisles, and a 2-2 cabin layout with no middle seats. Overhead bins were larger than any other regional jet of the time, allowing passengers to bring more personal items on board without crowding. Pilots also benefited from a shared type rating, which allowed for seamless transitions between variants and reduced training complexity for airlines operating multiple models. Airlines quickly realized the benefits. Economies of scale on maintenance, parts, and training made these jets more attractive than the competing Bombardier CRJ series, and passengers immediately noticed the difference. With a quieter, more spacious cabin, the E-Jets offered a travel experience that rivaled much larger aircraft. Yet, despite sharing the same DNA, the E-Jets' different sizes and roles would ultimately lead to dramatically different fates in airline fleets. The smaller E-175 would rise to dominate the regional market, while the larger E-190 would face obstacles that would prevent it from achieving the same level of success, especially in North America. The E-175 quickly became the favorite aircraft for U.S. regional operations, and its success was no accident. The key factor was the aircraft's perfect compliance with U.S. scope clauses. These clauses are part of airline union contracts that define the maximum size and weight of aircraft that regional carriers can operate. They exist to protect mainline pilot jobs and prevent airlines from using lower-paid regional crews to operate aircraft that would otherwise be flown by mainline pilots. The E-175, with 76 seats and a takeoff weight under the limit, fit these rules perfectly. Airlines could operate it extensively without violating contracts, making it an ideal aircraft for regional feeder operations. Major carriers like Delta, American, United, and Alaska found the E-175 to be the perfect tool for expanding their networks while respecting labor agreements. But scope clauses weren't the only reason for the E-175's popularity. Its size was perfect for a wide range of routes, offering enough capacity for profitable operations on thin and mid-density routes while keeping operating costs low. The E-175 could fly frequent services between smaller cities and hub airports, connecting passengers to larger networks without leaving empty seats on the aircraft. Passenger experience also played a major role in the aircraft's appeal. The E-175's 2-2 seating layout meant no middle seats, quiet cabin, wider aisles and a sense of space rarely seen on regional jets. These small comforts contributed to passenger satisfaction and loyalty, which in turn made the aircraft more valuable to airlines. The E-175 hit a rare sweet spot. It was efficient, compliant with labor rules, cost-effective and comfortable for passengers. Airlines rapidly adopted it. Regional operators like SkyWest, Republic, Envoy, Horizon and Mesa built entire fleets around it. 
wasn't just an aircraft, it was a solution to a complex set of operational, financial, and regulatory challenges that regional aviation had struggled with for decades. If you're enjoying this deep dive into aircraft strategy, hit like and subscribe. These breakdowns take a lot of research and your support helps us bring more aviation stories like this to life. The E-190, on the other hand, should have been a bigger star. It offered nearly 100 seats, a longer range, a wider cabin, and more powerful engines. Passengers traveling on the E-190 experienced a level of comfort closer to a downsized Airbus A320, complete with larger overhead bins and more legroom. Airlines around the world, JetBlue, Air Canada, KLM City Hopper, Lufthansa City Line, and Copa Airlines recognized its potential and successfully incorporated it into their fleets. Pilots praised the E-190's performance, reliability, and handling. From a technical perspective, it was a marvel, efficient, versatile, and capable of serving routes that would otherwise require a full-size mainline jet. Its economics made sense for medium demand routes and passengers appreciated the quiet cabin and spacious seating. Yet, despite all these advantages, the E-190 never reached the same level of adoption in North America. The reason was straightforward but critical. It didn't fit within U.S. scope clauses. This single limitation changed everything. Only mainline pilots could operate the E-190, which meant higher salaries, more complex crew scheduling, longer rest periods, and increased benefit costs. While the E-190 technically had more capacity than the E-175, the added seats came with disproportionately higher operating costs. Fuel consumption, engine power, runway length requirements, and mainline pilot wages all combined to reduce the economic advantage. Airlines quickly realized that on most regional routes, the E-190 simply wasn't cost effective. It became comparable to operating an Airbus A319 or Boeing 737-700, which offered similar economics with larger networks and better residual value. In short, the E-190's operational and economic advantages were neutralized by regulatory and labor restrictions creating a scenario where the E-175 was more practical for everyday operations. The challenges for the E-190 extended beyond scope clauses. Its slightly larger size offered more seats, yes, but these came at a steep cost. Airlines needed more powerful engines, which increased fuel burn and maintenance costs. The heavier airframe required longer runways, limiting its flexibility on regional routes. Crew costs were higher due to mainline certification requirements, and turnaround times were often longer than on smaller jets. As a result, the E-190 often ended up in a paradoxical situation. It was too expensive to operate profitably on smaller regional routes, yet not large enough to compete with the efficiency of narrow-body jets on higher density routes. Airlines attempting to use the E-190 often had to operate at lower frequencies or accept lower margins, undermining the aircraft's advantages. Meanwhile, newer narrow-body aircraft like the Airbus A319neo and Boeing 737 MAX 7 offer better seat mile economics on similar routes. The middle ground the E-190 was designed to occupy effectively disappeared, leaving it without a clear operational niche in North America. Over time, lessers had difficulty placing E-190s. Residual values declined and some airlines retired or sold them early. Despite being an excellent aircraft in engineering terms, the E-190 simply didn't match the regulatory, operational, and economic realities of the U.S. regional airline environment. If you're enjoying this breakdown of regional jets and airline strategy, hit like and leave a comment with which aircraft family you want us to analyze next. Even after two decades, the E-175 remains the backbone of U.S. regional aviation. Its enduring popularity is the result of a perfect alignment of economics, labor agreements, and operational flexibility. The aircraft's size continues to fit perfectly under scope clause limits, which remain largely unchanged. Airlines cannot operate aircraft larger than 76 seats with regional crews, which effectively protects the E-175 from direct competition. The E-175E2, Embraer's updated version with new engines and approved efficiency, failed to meet these limits, leaving airlines reliant on the original E-175. Major regional carriers have expanded their E-175 fleets in response. SkyWest, Republic, Envoy, and Horizon continue to invest in this aircraft. 
while American, Delta, and United rely heavily on E-175s for their feeder networks. The aircraft's combination of range, fuel efficiency, and passenger comfort makes it ideal for a wide variety of routes. Short hops to medium haul sectors connecting regional airports to major hubs. Passengers appreciate the aircraft's quiet cabin, the 2-2 layout with no middle seat, and the reliability of service. For many travelers, the E-175 is indistinguishable from a mainline jet in terms of comfort while still providing the convenience of regional service. Airlines, pilots, and passengers all benefit, creating a virtuous cycle that has ensured the aircraft's continued relevance. Even with the emergence of new regional aircraft concepts, the E-175 remains difficult to replace. Mitsubishi Space Jet Project, for example, struggled to deliver an aircraft that could compete economically and fit within U.S. labor rules. Scope clauses and market expectations continue to favor the E-175, making it likely to remain the dominant regional jet for years to come. For now, there is no real replacement on the horizon. Scope clauses are unlikely to change, unions remain committed to protecting mainline pilot jobs, and competitors have not produced a jet that can match the E-175's combination of size, efficiency, and compliance. The E-175 is deeply embedded in North American airline operations with thousands of flights per day depending on it. Training programs, maintenance infrastructure, and pilot pipelines are all built around this aircraft. For many routes, it is not just the best option, it's the only viable option. The aircraft's combination of performance, comfort, and regulatory compliance has ensured its continued dominance, and it's likely to remain the cornerstone of regional operations well into the 2030s. If you want more deep dives into aviation strategy and aircraft comparisons, subscribe and comment with which matchup you want to see next. So, why did the E-175 succeed while the E-190 struggled? It wasn't just engineering, it wasn't just design, it wasn't even just economics. It was timing, capacity, and compliance with U.S. scope clauses. The E-175 landed in the perfect sweet spot, the right size, the right cost, and the right labor fit. E-190 was a great jet, but the E-175 was the perfect jet. That's why the E-175 continues to dominate the skies that the 190 could never fully claim.